attractive women is a trope I have long enjoyed, both in the fiction I write and in the fiction I consume. It was, however, only recently that I became aware of this affinity and how easy it has been throughout my life to stumble upon fiction that uses this trope, regardless of genre. I never realized that I was specifically drawn to it until someone pointed out that I used some variation of captive women in both my Mason Timeline books. And as I'm currently writing book three, you guessed it, I've got it in there too. Now, when I say captive women trope, I want to specify that I'm talking about a trope and not an entire genre. There is an entire genre dedicated to breaking the rules that I'm about to tell you. It's a genre designed exclusively for adults, and it's a genre that I generally don't read or edit, honestly, because it makes me and some other people very uncomfortable. This video is not about that. This is about kidnapping, intentional isolation or stranding in a remote place, or hostage situations involving a woman as victim and a male as perpetrator. Very often it's in drama or thriller genres, but not always. For instance, it was used to great comedic effect in the 1987 movie Overboard, another movie that could never be made today. We won't talk about the abominable gender-swapping remake. You're better than that, Anna Faris. But the original was funny, romantic, <laughs> and it really worked. In a more traditional use of the trope, Mary Kubica's The Good Girl used it and relied on audience expectations of that trope to conceal the twist ending. It was fantastic, and I super recommend it if you haven't read it. Oh, and by the way, links to all the media that I talk about are in the description below. Last but not least, it's a staple of romance, which I don't normally gravitate toward. But when the TV movie Stolen Women Captured Hearts aired on CBS in 1997 when I was 15, let's just say it made an impression. I wasn't the only one who loved it either, as demonstrated by the fact that it is still to this day in rotation on Lifetime movies. Because it's awesome. <laughs> and so, so hot. Where was I? All that said, using this trope does have its landmines, and if you're not careful, you can alienate your intended audience or, worse, disappoint them. So this video will be diving into the trope and talking about how to tailor it to the specific genre that you write. In addition to the examples I already listed, I'll largely be using Richie Tankersley Cussick's novel Scarecrow to illustrate each of the points. Since it perfectly encapsulates how to do things right and how to do things wrong. The first rule is to choose your time period and location carefully, as they can both strongly affect the believability of your story. Captive women are taken by stealth or by force. Force is self-explanatory. We're talking about kidnapping or hostage situations, and honestly, it doesn't need that much thought. The weapon of choice will change depending on your setting, as will law enforcement and surveillance capabilities. But overall, the setup of a by-force captive situation is pretty uniform. Being held captive by stealth means that it takes a little while for the woman to realize that she is in fact being held against her will, and it requires more planning. This is particularly true in modern settings with cell phones, ubiquitous internet, and people living pretty close to each other in most communities. So ask yourself how you can make it reasonable that the woman can't leave when she finally realizes something is wrong. In the case of Scarecrow, our captive woman is Pam, and she's held at a stranger's house by injuries initially, and then the unforgiving landscape. Her car was demolished in a crash, she can't walk out of there even after she starts to feel better, and there's no modern technology in the Appalachian house of her supposed rescuers, even though the story takes place in 1993. Pam senses early on that there's something very, very wrong in that house, despite how kind the women in the house are to her. No matter how they assure her that the gruff man of the house is all bark and no bite, and the fact that at the beginning she doesn't think she's a hostage. She just thinks these nice people are helping her and that she should be grateful. The house and its vibe are creepy, but she can't leave. Not even after the dying starts. The second rule is keep your age group in mind. I have an upcoming video that's going to be exclusively devoted to the first three books that Richie Tankersley Cusick wrote. Those, and the majority of her other works, are dedicated to YA readers, those between the ages of 12 and 18, although 18 is probably a little old for the YA market. In my youth, I read all of her books, but could never track down Scarecrow, so I actually read this one for the very first time this year. Thank you, Kindle. In reading it, I see now why I couldn't find it as a kid. 
This is an adult novel. It's definitely true that YA and adult fiction are getting closer to each other these days, but I don't necessarily approve of that trend, and you might find that your younger audience doesn't either. Scarecrow was odd because Richie Tankersley Cusick is mostly a YA author, and though I can't track down the exact numbers, I'm pretty confident that this book didn't sell great. Many authors I work with get an idea for a story and don't begin writing with a particular genre or audience in mind. They let the story unfold as it will, and then they worry about those categories later. This is fine, but it's important that your cover and your blurb set up expectations appropriately. Scarecrow's cover, both the original and the new one, do not establish that this book is for adults. They don't tell us that there's anything different about this one versus the other ones in her collection. They certainly don't tell us that Pam is in her early 30s and has lost a husband and a child, as opposed to the 16-year-olds in all of her other books. Scarecrow was still good. I honestly loved it. Mostly. But if I had actually found a copy of it as a teen, I don't think I would have liked it at all. Because audience matters. We're going to pause here for a trigger warning. If discussions of dubious consent and SA are upsetting for you, please skip to the timestamp on the screen. The third rule is to be very clear about consent. Like I talked about before, YA and adult books are becoming indistinguishable from each other. Both include swearing, substance abuse, sex on the page, and SA. There are benefits to this loosening of standards for what is considered appropriate for teen readers. But as far as I'm concerned, I think there's only one. The ability to actually provide details of an encounter allows you, the author, to make it very clear to the reader whether this is a clumsy hookup or an assault, even if it's not clear to the character in the book. Back in the 90s, this wasn't the case, and boy, did it cause a problem in Scarecrow. Like I said, this is clearly an adult book, but Richie Tankersley Cusick's YA background came through, and she only hinted at the encounter with Seth, which caused me both consternation and confusion. Take a look at this scene and ask yourself if this seems like something Pam is down with. As I read it, I would say emphatically no. So the scene did its job, right? Wrong. Because in the next scene, she kicks herself for quote unquote betraying Rachel, who is Seth's wife, as if this was something she chose to do. This guilt continues over the rest of the book as Pam and Seth get increasingly cozy. I was left completely unsure about what actually happened. Now, maybe Pam was victim blaming herself, or maybe it was a little bit more consensual than I thought. But leaving such an important element of the story to a reader's personal interpretation is bad writing. So make sure that your intent comes through loud and clear. If there's anything we don't need more of, it's the idea that even if a girl fights at first, she'll come to like it. No thank you. No thank you to all of that. Finally, rule four is to be very clear about how you want your audience to feel about the captor at the end. In Scarecrow, there's a huge twist at the end, one that I didn't see coming. It made sense of all of the weirdness in that house, and it showed that Seth had extenuating circumstances for his behavior. This is very common when an author wants the reader to come away with a positive feeling of the captor. In Mary Kubica's The Good Girl, the captor is actually one of our POV characters. So we know right off the bat that this guy, in his own misguided way, genuinely thinks he's saving Mia from a terrible death. Yes, he is brutal in confining her at the beginning but he thinks worse will happen if he delivers her to where he was hired to deliver her. By the end of the book, we feel positively about him and honestly a bit sorry for how things ended for him. It was very well done. In Scarecrow, things weren't so clear. Seth also had extenuating circumstances, and they were not minor. However, (laughs) they were largely self-inflicted. He could have gotten himself out of that at any time. So if he and Pam had ended up together... That would have been a severe WTF moment for pretty much all readers. The good news is that RTC very clearly intended the reader to walk away with ambiguous feelings about Seth, and she set that up perfectly. Yes, we saw that he was in a terrible situation, compounded by his own personal guilt. But we also saw he had other options of dealing with it. Pam's escape and happy ending came with a clear-eyed view of him, which was satisfying in how the book ended. Authors have a tendency to fall in love with their alpha males, and that's all well and good. But don't push to make him into a good guy at the end of it if it doesn't work with the story as you've told it. 
Don't ask your readers to overlook mass murder, no matter how smoldering he is, or how good he looks on a horse. If there are extenuating circumstances in the captor's behavior, do they fully justify his actions? Don't get so caught up in the chemistry of it that you forget the suffering your captor has inflicted. A price must be paid, at least if you want your audience to stay on board with you. So those are my guidelines for crafting captive women in non-romance tropes. And if you like the non-romance variety of the captive women trope, you can check out both books of my Mason Timeline trilogy, which are linked below. In book one, we're dealing with a woman from the future who is being held captive as a slave in Saxon-era Britain. And in the second one, we're dealing with a futuristic dystopian situation where a woman is being held captive by an interrogator and doesn't let her go when the interrogation is done. Good times. If you have a favorite book or a movie that involves a kidnapped woman and a sexy male kidnapper, I would love for you to tell me about it in the comment sections below. So that's all I have for this week. If you like this video, let me know with a like, subscribe, and a comment so I know to make more of them. And until next week, take care and write...